Andre, welcome to Build with Demo. You're the founder of Get Grass and the Wind Network. And why don't you just kick us off by telling us how you got into all of that and, and giving us the, the origin story and, and who you are and what what is Get Grass? Yeah, definitely. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here, guys. Um, yeah, always a pleasure to speak with you uh, and other founders in the space. Um, I guess a bit about myself. I went to school for nuclear engineering, did some stuff in finance for a bit. I went back to graduate school and uh, explored stuff like computational physics and probability theory for a while. Um, while I was in graduate school, I actually started a, I guess, small to medium sized startup where we were hosting a ton of scaling infrastructure for web scraping businesses. And that's where I really learned about this space. And at the time I had a, you know, this hypothesis that with, you know, IPv4, like the total amount or the, the supply of IP addresses being limited and everything moving online during the pandemic, um, there'd be a massive demand for more and more IPs, especially as websites became more and more sophisticated in understanding the value of their data and how to protect it from being scraped or, or, or rather like how to wall it off and like safeguard it. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, this business went fairly well. Uh, we ran a lot of these, uh, we ran this in like a, in a data center sort of infrastructure on bare metal servers. Uh, but we had a lot of issues with scaling. Um, uh, and we realized that the most value comes out of these networks when you're using re actual residential networks that are distributed globally. Um, so then anyway, that was kind of the seed for the idea of grass. And as we started building grass, um, we, we started exploring like how are businesses currently doing this, right? Because there are companies out there that will scrape their entire, their competitors entire website, like daily. Um, and they have to leverage millions of real residential networks in order to do this. And we were asking ourselves, how on earth are they doing this right now? And we quickly realized um, there are other companies in this space that are literally installing like what some would call malware, but what others would just call completely unfair, like software and like sneaking SDKs into apps and devices that like that are being marketed to mass consumer bases. And so I download a screensaver and somebody's using my the access to my my browser to go and scrape prices off of Amazon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, if you're a target, for example, you have to scrape about 30 million SKUs daily from your competitors. So you're going to scrape the entirety of eBay, for instance, the entirety of uh, Best Buy and like yep. a few other companies. Yeah. And some guy that just downloaded a screensaver, like you said, on his smart TV doesn't realize that that screensaver is actually free and ad free because it is siphoning off a little bit of his bandwidth and selling it to the target. <laughs> um, sure. And, you know, this is like kind of a practice yeah. that started off. In, and the value in is in the distribution. The, the value yeah. is in the distribution across physical space. So also having, you know, an IP address associated with a given city means that you'll see a different view of the internet than somebody who's in Los Angeles. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, th that's exactly what it is. You want to know what the prices are in different stores in different geographies. And the best way to do that is to just use real networks and see what consumers are seeing in those geographies. Um, and, you know, these practices sort of slowly evolved from existing in just e-commerce and spread to like ad tech first and now into AI. Uh, it's, you know, obviously no secret that AI models use probably more data than any other type of model in the world, especially like the LLMs that have been coming out recently. Yep. Um, and as companies start understanding the value of the data that they're putting, especially language data on their websites, they're starting to make massive compromises between, okay, like, do we want to limit traffic um, and like start, you know, walling off and like paywalling a lot of our content? Or, or even just, you know, ma making it more difficult to index and scrape uh, at the expense of uh, lower traffic. So uh, we, we've quickly like started noticing AI companies just like surge into the space. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious to hear your take on where you think the web is going if all of this plays out in the future, because, you know, we had this very like, you know, it, it started off as a, a publishing platform where the internet looked the same to everybody, depending, you know, no matter where you were really. And then now we've moved into this world where everybody has a much more, you know, fragmented viewpoint and people are starting to even increasingly fragment it and make personalized versions of the web as they get more sophisticated about knowing who they're publishing to. And 
yeah, I'm curious to hear like if this all plays out and you guys build this huge residential proxy node network and everybody's scraping their own data, their own version of the internet, like what, what does that look like in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. I uh, have a lot of thoughts on this actually. And I think there's a huge risk right now with the direction that the internet is going in. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Google recently put out a proposal um, which suggests that every Chrome browser should use like an IP obfuscation tool that will be built into them. Uh, that'll allow users to just, you know, they're pitching it as kind of a privacy thing, right? Like if you're a user and you're using this Google IP obfuscation thing, uh, any website you visit won't know which IP address is yours and they won't be able to customize content for you. Um, that's how they're pitching it. But what's actually happening is like what they want you to do is route all of your web traffic through Google servers. So they know exactly what you're doing, first of all. And secondly, they can be the arbiter of, is this a real user? Is this a web crawler or a web scraper? Um, and what is their geography? Um, so they want to be that middleman. And like, I saw that proposal and it actually really freaked me out. And what freaked me out more was the fact that a lot of people saw this and their immediate response was, oh, great, more privacy. Um, but obviously there's like right. huge trade-offs there, right? Yeah. And, and, but, you know, just zooming out from that in terms of like the internet, just slowly becoming completely fragmented and, uh, becoming inaccessible. Like the thing is it's being, it's becoming inaccessible to like the average person. Like if you're an average person that wants to train an LLM and you want to go and scrape a ton of data from the internet. That's going to be very difficult for you unless you have, like, you know, access to a huge network of these residential IP addresses or a huge network of like distributed web scrapers. The average person yep. doesn't really have this or is being priced out of it. And what you're left mm -hmm. with is a small number of huge organizations that that solely have the power to do this. Like, right. and this is actually part of why like a lot of companies are now pivoting into search engines. It's because if you're a search engine, every website is giving you permission to crawl their entire website and they're not blocking your IPs. So that's kind of a funny thing that we've been seeing um, that, that we think is going to be a huge narrative in the coming years is everyone wanting to have their own search engine from, you know, Apple to Microsoft that already has one. And, and it's no coincidence that Bing and ChatGPT are so intrinsically intertwined these days. Um, the Apple Google search engine deal is one of those things where it kind of reminds me of that that meme where you have like this, you know, huge structure built up and then there's one little like toothpick holding it together. Like all of <laughs> Apple's R and D budget is basically funded by that one search deal. And you can see them on the other side thinking like, wow, we should really have our own search engine, but like they can't either. <laughs> they'd have to figure out, a, they'd have a $30 billion hole in their, their balance sheet if that, if that fell out. Um, it's, oh, it's one of the most interesting. Yeah. Definitely one of the most interesting areas in tech. I've been using perplexity, um, quite a bit over the last couple of weeks and have found that to be kind of a different experience and um the extent to which they're switching between the different models and incorporating um you know you, you're really getting the it reminds me a little bit of um alta vista back in the day where it would search like six different search engines for you yeah. in, the, in the early 2000s i'm kind of dating myself there a little bit but um <laughs> no yeah anyways so that that all makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about Get Grass. I'm going to show everybody. This is my dashboard here. And since you know we we met um, maybe a month and a half ago or two months ago, and I I connected, I downloaded the browser extension. I've been traveling around a little bit, so one of the networks I've been on, I think, has uh, um, some security on it that prevents it from from working. But I've been you know mining over the last or getting or earning some points over the last couple of weeks. I was able to participate in. The closed alpha. So I'm a very early adopter here and got a bunch of points there. Tell me what's going on when I'm running this browser extension and, and what is actually happening. And then we can talk about, um, you know, how, how you're sort of designing the network and where you see it going from there. Yeah, definitely happy to. Uh, so the extension actually doesn't really have access to anything on your computer other than some of your computer resources and some of your bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so like the only thing it actually reads in terms of like who you are, like your identity is like the email and the password that you enter into the extension when you make your account. Um, beyond that, it's kind of completely anonymous and separate from the rest of your system. Uh, and what it's really doing is it's accepting web requests from a network of routers that are currently centralized, but we plan on decentralizing them later. I can talk about that in a moment. Um, anyway, it yep. receives these web requests and then it will route them through your network to specific websites. So if, for instance, we want to scrape a bunch of blog posts um, 
and you know blog posts are perfect for LLMs for a number of reasons, right? Um, and we want to scrape those blog posts from certain geographies because you know in certain geographies they'll display an A like a specific language and B like they'll just be open to that geography. Um, we'll route all of that traffic through the nodes in that like physical area. Um, yep. And then after the after the web extension routes that request, it receives a web response. Uh, the web response is basically like your raw data. And then it will feed it back to the routers, which will clean it up and push it to a data set. Um, now, one thing that we haven't implemented yet, but will be sort of critical to this network design is something that we like to call proof of request. And the idea here is to actually store a proof on chain every time a web request is sent to a web server to actually prove that that data actually came from that website. Um, and like, this might not seem like a huge problem now, but we can see it becoming a massive one uh, because there are a lot of open source data sets out there right now. And data is sort of starting to follow in the steps of ad tech where there's a lot of incentive to poison your data set. There are a lot of companies out there that are saying, hey, you're trading yeah. an LLM with that. Before you get your LLM to ingest the data set, why don't we throw in a bunch of sentences that say, hey, this store X is the best place to buy this product Y. And if you have like a thousand or 10,000 instances of that in your data set, then your LLM, when you ask it about this product, it'll start shilling you that store. Um, it's very similar to like the early days of, of, of ad tech where people started saying, hold on a second. Like there's a lot of avenues of, towards monetization, whether it's right or wrong. So something that we kind of want to package into this product is this idea that we've got this immutable ledger. It's all already been built, right? This technology exists. Um, and all we really need to do is prove that, hey, this line in this data set actually came from this website. That blog didn't actually have a million reviews telling you, hey, that's the best place to buy that. Um, this is actually where it came from. So that, that, that's kind of like the, the end state of what, what we're building here. Yeah, the world in which we have LLMs generating synthetic data to feed the training set of other LLMs and injecting, you know, specific narratives or messages into it. And, you know, that kind of data exhaust getting fed back into the system is something that I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to do, but it doesn't seem like a really awesome outcome. That's going to be a product that people really love. Um, when it, when it comes down to it. But I suppose that that's kind of what's happening now with the whole SEO driven world. It's just that Google is kind of sitting in the middle of all of that for us anyways. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that that's interesting. W one thing that is in a kind of parallel with the, the demo world is that we see a lot of these autonomous driving systems that are based, you know, basically you know, it, trained in a very similar way to how an LLM is trained. And it's based on all of this real world driving data that people have collected and then done reinforcement learning on top of to say, hey, this is good. This is bad. This car got in an accident or, you know, this disengagement led to this outcome in, in the driving task. And what you realize when you start to scale that up is first that people are going to want a ton of transparency into that underlying data set. And that's really hard to you know, give people. And, and also something that the companies view as, as their IP and, and something that's, you know, a competitive advantage. And then you also realize that the, the training data, it really depends on where you've collected it. And so you have, you know, o open pilot is one of the, the projects I follow. I run comma AI in my car and, you know, they, they released an update and all the cars were doing rolling, stops at, at stoplights because it was trained in California and that's how people drive there. And it's, you know, this sort of illegal behavior that's been trained into the model because of that. But, um, you know, ultimately like their, their approach is super interesting to me because it is much more transparent than what you get with Tesla full self driving or with Waymo system, because they're you know, basically locking down their data set and providing only selective access into it. And then when an issue happens, you can't really like pull apart why. Um, and, and I see a lot of parallels with, with what you guys are doing, except, you know, more focused on you know, text, text-based generative AI. Um, do you guys also process images as well? Is that part of the, the scraping that's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're actually working with a fairly large AI foundation, um, and their interest is image links. Um, the, the way a lot of generative AI models get trained is actually you have a massive data set of image links 
which is like the link to the picture on the internet, uh, next to like a bunch of tags and like the caption, for instance, from where it came and like some of the surrounding text. Um, yeah, so we do we do work with that. Um, the, the, the reason why we use image links is uh, twofold. One is like there's this obvious copyright concern when it comes to, um, you know, like monetizing this type of data. Like an, an image link isn't the image itself. It's just a link to the image. And that's common practice in the industry at the moment. Uh, and secondly, uh, it just takes a lot less uh, disk space to store a link than it does to store an image. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But yeah, we, yeah. We, we do work with images a lot. I, I think you can I, I actually really like what Demo does uh, in terms of, I guess it's a trend that I've quite enjoyed watching develop across, I guess, the deep in space, you'd call it, um, in that the whole idea behind crypto in the first place was A, permissionless, like borderless payments, and, and B, self-custody. Um, and and I guess like, on top of that, you can build these abstractions of uh, permissionless composability, blah, blah, blah. But uh, what Deepin's been doing yep. recently like, is actually allowing people to self-custody their data in a sense. Like all these different products, they all come down to like data transfer at the end of the day. E even, even Helium, which is, I guess, the biggest one, like bandwidth at the end of the day is just data transfer. Uh, and the idea of self-custody, right. not just self-custodying data, but also owning the upside in it is something very, very powerful that can't be accomplished with fiat, in my opinion. Like you could go ahead and easily pay millions of drivers, I guess in your case, with cash, but they won't- We thought about doing that at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so did we. I mean, it, it's a it's a very compelling idea, right? Because you can you can actually max out your margins quite well and run a very very successful Web two business doing something like that. But at the end of the day, like, is it really fair if the users that are contributing to this network don't own any of it? Um, and, and then that's something that's like it's a very powerful concept in crypto that I quite enjoy. And like, yeah, that's something I, I I've been thinking is really cool with Demo, right? Like you're talking about like not just the data, but then the insights that are derived from that, allowing a user right. to capture that entire vertical of value accrual. Um, like very similar to us, like you're not just selling your bandwidth, you're selling the data that was scraped with that bandwidth plus the AI model that was scraped for, or that was trained from the data that was scraped with your bandwidth, right? So um, I, think, I think it's a very similar idea and, and I do quite like that uh, decentralization enables these things. It, it enables those things. And then what we're starting to get really excited about is the next level up that you can build on top of that more solid foundation, which starts to look like a more decentralized version of, you know, in the States, we have AAA, the American Automobile Association, where they like aggregate all these services and sell them to people who have a membership. And like, in our case, we also have data from those users. And so, you know, there's, there's people starting to think about like, what kind of new bundles of services can you create for people that you that you know, sort of assume the existence of their vehicle being connected and how much of a discount can you get them um, you know, for things that they're going to spend money on anyways, like tires and insurance and maintenance and kind of like automate all of that stuff. And the AI tools that are being developed are going to help connect the dots in that kind of marketplace a lot faster. And that's something that I think is probably still going to take a year or so for these, you know, really capable agents to show up, but then the ability to run one of those and give it context about everything in your life without having to leak any data to a third party is going to be super compelling, not just to individuals, but to businesses that are then like, instead of people calling me up and scheduling an appointment for maintenance on their car, it's like their AI agent is just automatically scheduling it and the car like just shows up and like all that can happen in the background with people just sort of like signing transactions and saying, yes, like I you know approve this, go, go take care of it. And that's a much more like appealing vision of the future where all of these new automation technologies and AIs are working directly on top of my personal data. And I think one of the things that, you know, I tell people when they're, they're asking me things like, well, you know, what are you excited about in AI? It's like, I'm excited about, you know, <laughs> the fact that I personally own a lot of my own data and that's going to make AI much more useful for me in the future. And that's one of the big, like, you know, calls to action that we're really trying to drive home with people. And, and a lot of people, I think with Demo also overly fixate on the past data that has been collected versus your ability to collect the data in the future, which is truly what's valuable. Like <laughs> having the network that can show, um, you know, the real time state of something like when you know we're talking to a big enterprise or company like they don't really care about the 
data you already have. I mean, it's useful for, for building a history and increasing, you know, certainty and noticing patterns and, and things like that. But really what they care about is like, what's going to happen next month? And can you detect when somebody has a flat tire or is speeding or, you know, wants to sell their car? And, and you know, all of those things are, um, you know, just sort of compounding advantages that show up once you figure out a model to help people start taking control. Um, and then, you know, you're going to start to see, I think, a whole new set of businesses that are built with the assumption that people are able to control their own data and they're going to be much less extractive because they're not um, maintaining state. You know, there's no back end for these businesses. It's literally just, you know, a front end that connects some existing service to a bunch of people that have their own data. And and that's that's super cool. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, we're in the very early stages of, but all the pieces are there. There's no more science that needs to happen. It's just like implementation and kind of stacking the bricks together and making a product that, that people actually accept and, and want. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Tell me about the growth. So you guys have been, you guys have been live for like two months and you have a million users or something like that on, on the actually network. What has that been like? You know, give me the, yeah, give me the real, like the, the real talk on how that's going. Um, and, and yeah, the good and the bad, Don't leave, leave it all out there. Sure. Yeah. Happy to. Uh, so we actually launched our close alpha six months ago. Um, it's been referral gated. Uh, we did not anticipate the level of growth that we've gotten, especially over the last month and a half, roughly. Um, it was sort of steadily growing. We got to around 80,000 users in November. Um, and then from then until now, we're at over half a million real users, right? Like there's tens of millions of accounts that we're going to need to zero out. Yep. Um, um, but yeah, that, that, that's been like, you know, you, you know, like in terms of our projections, like that vastly exceeded expectations and it's caused us to have to like scurry to really just rebuild our entire infrastructure on the back end. So, you know, in, in the last month and a half or so, we, we've been seeing a lot of stability issues in terms of, um, you know, you, you get, when you have one day with like 150,000 people being referred onto the network and the network was built for maybe a hundred thousand people, um, to start, uh, it, it requires a lot of not just like hardware upgrades, but also software. Uh, so that, that's been a constant struggle. And every time we upgrade our infrastructure to handle, you know, another million connections, another million people very quickly try to fill that, uh, fill that void. Right. So, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, and what's, uh, it's what's been the most like exactly. unexpected, yeah, other than the people showing up, um, you know, and, and one, one thing that I've found interesting is that if people are, you know, we, at, at Demo, when we first set up the test net and, you know, had a very simple point system in there, we kind of, we had some insights early on, which was, we don't want people to, we don't want to incentivize people to drive around unnecessarily. And we want to incentivize long-term connections to the network. And like both of those things have kind of um, you know, played out, we've been able to create a more healthy community out of the initial incentive structure that, that we all had sort of settled on as, as the test net. And like, how, how is your understanding of the impact of incentives changed over the six months you've been doing this? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So uh, as you know, like the, the end state of our, of our product is really for, you know, you to have this extension or app or router or whatever it is running, uh, we're going to have a few other distributions available soon. Um, and every time some of your bandwidth and compute gets used to go and scrape data, um, you get compensated for that. And then you get compensated in, per in perpetuity for whatever piece of the data set that you help scrape. That's sort of what we want to build long-term. The thing is like these sort of networks aren't very viable unless they're at so, like, a pretty large scale. And like the type of scale I'm talking about is like right. five to 10 million users. Yeah. So, you know, we were thinking very early on, like, could we start incentivizing people immediately um, just for logging in and you know, displaying some amount of uptime? And, and we did have a few other third parties come in and actually approach us and offer to just pay us to put their SDKs into our app. And it was kind of ironic because that's literally what we're trying to solve. So obviously we had to reject them. Right. <laughs> that would have potentially helped us compensate people sooner. Um, but yeah, so, so what we realized was, okay, we can have a point system and the earlier you are, like, I guess, by definition, the better, because you get more uptime. And we built it such that it's referral only. So the higher up you are on a specific referral tree, um, the more impact you've had on growing the network. And that helps us a lot in, you know, making the decision of how to retroactively reward users later. Uh, we really do like using points um, 
for this uptime incentivization because we want to reach a state where we don't really want to incentivize uptime. We want to incentivize the real work that these extensions or, or, or apps are doing. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's been a very good way of bootstrapping the network in my opinion. And uh, I do quite like it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the threshold that you feel like you have to get to is maybe one more order of magnitude from where you're at today in terms of active users. So you've gone, I mean, initially when I joined, it was, you, I think you've gone maybe two orders of magnitude since then. So next <laughs> month you'll be there, right? Um, five to 10 million users is like real users, like actively connected at the same time is probably the place where we want to be. But there are a lot of other things that do impact like the full network launch. One of them being the reliability of the underlying infrastructure. It's like one of the nice things about having an incentivized beta is like what you're really doing is you're earning points for helping test the network. So things mm -hmm. are expected to break. We want to reach a point where everything is, you know, fail safe and like and completely, like it's just like we don't have any risk of like scale, scaling or, or anything similar before we can actually launch that network. So um, there, there are a few things we have to consider. And then, and then there's also like, you know, how is the bandwidth going to be used? Um, how are those decisions going to be made? Um, but yeah, in, in terms of like statistics, you're, you're, you're right. It's about an order of magnitude. So I have my Saga phone sitting here in my bag. I'll pull it out. And I'm curious to hear, so you guys decided to launch your Android app um, and it's starting out, oh, maybe I left it. I'm primarily an iPhone person, but um, tell me about that part of the sort of go-to-market strategy with having the individual mobile app now for users and also just generally what kind of reception you've seen in, in the whole, you know, Solana mobile stack world and, and how you see that kind of impacting that ecosystem. Because it, it is something that as somebody who's produced, uh, you know, 15,000 crypto enabled hardware IOT devices. It's something that we think quite a bit about. Yeah. Uh, I do quite love the idea of the Saga. I, I always thought it was really cool to have a phone that is just extracting as much value as possible out of its underlying hardware and, and its, and its bandwidth capabilities and giving it back to the person that actually owns that phone. Mm -hmm. I think. At scale, what it's going to do is actually open a lot of people's eyes and make them realize, oh my God, I've been getting robbed. Because a lot of people, you know, they'll they'll overpay for a phone plan, they'll overpay for a phone, and then they won't get paid for the things that they're giving away when by owning that phone and by storing everything on that phone and using it every day. Um, but a lot of people don't really have a great understanding um, of like the amount of value that they're really giving away, and what the saga phones are doing is actually just like showing you, Hey, this is like the number, <laughs> like th th this is, this is how much you can actually earn if you were to actually monetize everything. And the crazy thing is like, it's just a drop in the bucket in terms of what's being monetized. There's so many other things right. that your phone collects that you can do with the data on a phone. So I think it's very exciting. And, and like, you know, that on its own, um, aligned so well with our philosophy that we thought, okay, it makes a lot of sense for us to make our mobile launch exclusively on saga. Um, and as you probably know, we also had a, a SAGA giveaway like a couple of months ago. Um, and yeah, very, very excited about that project. Cool. Um, yeah, it's certainly something that we think a lot about in the context of Demo is the, the amount of assets that are sitting around being underutilized, especially as people are starting to put real, uh, really capable, like the most powerful computer that most people own if they have a Tesla is in their car and <laughs> there's a huge, you know, $40,000 battery sitting on top of it. And, um, they're all going to start driving themselves around at some point. And yeah, there's, um, you, in, in going to CES last week, one of the things that I always think about, it's kind of thrown in your face. There is the entire smartphone industry. I mean, the smartphone is obviously the biggest consumer electronics product category, but if you take everything else and lump it in there, it's still only about 20% of the global automotive industry revenue. And so you think about these companies that are just like churning out this hugely expensive electronics product that has basically no use if you're not sitting in it, driving around and, and start to think about it more as a developer platform, certainly like the folks at, at Tesla are doing. And um, 
some of the implications downstream from that is is where I I think a lot of the next generation of like really big companies are going to get built and and also where there's an opportunity to really tear down a lot of these existing monopolies that exist between people and their data or people and their you know attention and there, there's um just just having a product like the saga phone that shows you you know here's what happens if you kind of like wipe away all of that crap and put people in charge of um the seed phrase and uh you know the app store and and all that then yeah, there's there's going to be some really interesting experiments that that get run out of that. I think. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What, what else? Um, I mean, we haven't really talked about the whole deep in space. It seems like everybody is kind of arriving at that as the the right acronym to use, which is is good and I guess less confusing. But what what else excites you about the space? And and I guess you consider Grass to be a deep in project. I certainly do. I think it's. Um, you're building a massive decentralized infrastructure network of uh, personal computers and, and other devices. But um, where do you see that developing in the next couple of years? And, and are there any areas in particular ecosystems that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, um, I, I guess to answer your first question, I do think Grass is a deep end product. Um, I have seen like a few people actually debate that within our community. Like, does this count as deep end or not? I do think at the end of the day, um, it does monetize a small amount of CPU and a decent amount of bandwidth. And even though you're not paying for a separate device at this moment in order to do that, um, you do own a device that you did pay for and you are doing that. So yeah, it, it, it is. So I caught that you guys are coming to CES next year. You have something to maybe 2025. You'll be in the deep end zone at, at CES with us. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. Okay. All right, cool. I, I mean, yeah. I heard you maybe allude to having a hardware product. That would be very exciting. I, yeah, yeah, I tweeted about a box. Um, a few of the specifics are still being figured out, but uh, I might as well share a bit of alpha. Like there's a lot of stuff that you can do by running a separate OS in a box um, that you can't do on a device that's being used for other things, such as your laptop or your phone. Uh, mainly being like, you know, we don't want to drain people's batteries by running like a thousand yep. uh, web crawlers and like indexing the entire web on their laptop or like their phone. And not to mention like the, whatever they're paying for bandwidth, especially if they don't have an unlimited plan. Um, so we've been exploring the idea of a physical box that you can either plug into like your wall or a router. Uh, we haven't really released those details, but uh, the idea would be we could actually like, run a bunch of these agents essentially. Um, I guess people are calling them AI agents these days, but like what they would do is go and determine, okay, what, given we're in this geography, what's the most valuable thing from the internet to scrape? We're going to go and scrape it and sell that data all out of your device. And you can, all you have to do is passively like, you know, check your phone dashboard or whatever and see how much the box is earning for you. And you've got this agent in there that's just going out there and crawling the web and contributing to a huge data set. So um, we think that could be something very exciting. Uh, it's in the roadmap. But cool. Yeah. There'll be yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of something, even just for me, I mean, I know this is not exactly what you guys are doing, but, but something that's just indexing all of my personal data, keeping it on a, a private server, and then having an LLM that's trained on it that has, you know, just, I, I'm excited to see what Apple does with Siri, because I feel like they're going to definitely start to move it in, in that direction. But I think there is, and this is, you know, one of the things that, um, George from from Comma AI is is building now with Tiny Corp is like the kind of home server basically or like the home yeah. home GPU stack that everybody's going to need. And I feel like it's going to end up just being kind of like a washing machine or um, you know a, a dishwasher, or whatever you know appliance you have in your kitchen. Everybody's going to have their you know now it's 10k worth of GPUs, but in five years <laughs> it'll be thousand, two thousand dollars just sitting there running your vacuum cleaner, you know, uh, offloading the data from your car, taking, yeah, that, that'll be a better world if we get to that point. I, yeah, I think it's, I can't, I can't wait. I don't know what would replace it other than, yeah. The, the uh, yeah. Like is, a is, um, opener or something. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I, uh, in, ingesting all of the data from your smart home and, and spitting out recommendations for you. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, you, you asked me like, uh, what area I'm actually most excited about within Deepin outside of anything data related, which, which I think really is the future, right? Like that's kind of the idea is like, you can leverage a lot of physical hardware and 
and like physical networks to just go and like amass like massive quantities of data um, and, and pay people for it too. Uh, the thing that I actually think is pretty exciting is um, like deep ends that are tackling sustainable energy, notably solar panels. Mm -hmm. Um, I have some family that lives in a, I guess, like second world country that like, and, and over there, like if you set up a solar panel, you're forced to sell all the energy from it to the government. Yep. Um, and obviously the rate they're giving you isn't great. Um, I think this is probably a trend, like among many countries that have like tons of natural resources, um, that individuals could potentially, um, like monetize, but they're, they're being blocked by either some sort of like large organization or a government or just uh, like not having the ability to sell it or have, like the right connections or things like that. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting, right? Like the idea that, hey, you know, there are other buyers in this market and we'll help you open the doors to that. Uh, and I, and yep. I do think things like sustainable energy are like one of the really cool ways that that might be done. Yeah, I think a hot take that I have is that there really only need to be maybe four or five deep end protocols that all of the applications are then built on top of. And like the whole benefit of building a new protocol is addressing some kind of market or coordination failure. And so in telecom, Helium makes a lot of sense because people participating in building the network at the edge allows them to add service in a place where you know, AT&T, Verizon wouldn't, they can you know, have all these more compelling than like cost dynamics. Energy certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, although you can look at a lot of energy utilities, like they're not the same everywhere, right? And some of them are a lot more open than others. Like Texas, in, the grid in Texas works completely differently than the grid in, in Massachusetts, even though they're in the same country. And and so energy is, is an interesting one because there already kind of are deep end networks for energy. Like it's like, you know, essentially user owned or, you know, the government kind of owns it. and um, in some cases you can upgrade it at the edge or, you know, solar panels and batteries are, are starting to allow that. And then, you know, obviously we're very focused on mobility and we think there's a real protocol to be made for increasing the amount of coordination that can happen with these you know, physical assets on, on the road. And, you know, the geospatial data part of it is I think kind of adjacent to that and, and something where there's like, you know, those networks and then what you're doing with just allowing people to suck in all of the data and, and to, use it in these other protocols and applications is kind of like um, like a service that you can create uh, on top of it or around it. And people are starting to kind of explore all of those territories. <laughs> and yeah, one, one thing that worries me a little bit is that we're going to see a world in which, you know, kind of like what just happened with um, all of the L1 blockchains and now it's sort of happening with the L2 blockchains where like people just sort of fragment off into like a million different directions instead of <laughs> coalescing around like, here's one thing that we can actually like build and, and deliver value with. Um, <laughs> And yeah, ho hopefully that's something that we can you know help avoid at least for for one section of that. World. I, but, um, yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you there. Actually, I wouldn't say it's even that much of a hot take. Take it's it's fairly logical. Um, I do think that the trend you mentioned with a lot of L ones and L twos popping up, uh, I think that's a symptom of people viewing modularity as a feat, like as a feature or like a reason to build something. Um, as opposed to just like a characteristic. Um, I think, you know, for, and that's just one example, right? But like being modular just for the sake of being modular might not always be the right answer. Um, so, you yeah. know, I guess in the parallel to our own, our own uh, protocol would be, uh, like we like to think of ourselves as a decentralized common crawl. Uh, like for, for people that aren't familiar, common crawl is the uh, massive open data set that more or less every AI or every LLM has ingested in order to train itself, there isn't really a need for another common crawl at the end of the day in the web two space. Um, right. Be, it, because like if the data has been scraped and has been stored in one place, like every other like LLM can be trained on it or fine tuned with different like subsets, subsets of it. Now, like the, the that's reason is the public we, web. And that's the public web. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> And then and the reason we see an opportunity actually is because a lot of the data in common crawl is like five years old. Um, and a lot of it is, and the reason like a lot of websites stop being crawled by it is because they started putting up IP geo, like geo restrictions, like common crawl uses AWS servers. Most websites are now blocking data center servers. 
and they don't really have access to a huge distributed residential network that could actually just go and scrape this all at once. And that's why we saw an opportunity and similar to yourselves, right? Like there, I don't think there's a single web two company out there that's actually collecting all this car data and like helping. Yeah. I, I just don't think this exists. You they tried. Out. Yeah. The automakers yeah. tried to get together and create these two companies that were meant to be data brokers for the first 50 million cars they connected to the internet. And then they realized that it's not very valuable to be a data broker if you don't have like control or a relationship with the end user in the case of the automotive industry. Like the value of the data is, can you sell somebody something more effectively? Can you like be there when they need some sort of transaction? And then the other thing is the automakers themselves didn't love the transparency that provided when it came to things like autonomous driving or uh, electric vehicle battery health. And so there's really sort of a disincentive around opening up that data. And we actually tried to show up and, and buy the initial product that we were interested in when we started incubating the idea behind Demo was coming up with a sort of canonical score of electric vehicle battery health. And we tried to go buy the data from the data brokers and they wouldn't sell it to us because the OEMs wouldn't let them. And so we kind of knew like, okay, well, there's all these recalls happening with EV batteries and we can you know detect them by, by looking at the data. But, but actually like really what you need is the ground truth and you need to put that data back in the hands of the owners and allow them to you know, collectively monetize it directly because otherwise nobody's ever going to build a product on top of this if they don't control it and now the oems are in a situation with cars at least where you know uh toyota is the biggest automaker in the world and they're like 14 percent of cars on the road or something like that maybe less and like you know you drive around in la and half the cars are teslas but they're less less than two percent of cars in in the us so like it's so fragmented that there's if one OEM tries to be very restrictive with their data policies, then consumers are just not going to buy their car. I mean, it's going to make it such a less appealing product for them. And they're the, the market dynamics are such that it's not like Apple and Android, although that might be sort of the next generation. Like I think there's actually a world in which, you know, Tesla sells 50% of the new cars on the road in the U S in like 10 years from now. And everybody else is kind of, <laughs> I mean, they're already doing that with EVs. Like they're like, 60 to 70 percent of EV sales right now and yeah. um yeah having having a counterbalance to that from a, a data perspective is is what we're after yeah totally um, makes sense. well this has gone on way way longer than I thought yeah. initially yeah. any any other um th I mean it's, it's great and and of course we'll have to um we'll have to check back in in a few months any other uh parting words calls to action for people um one, one thing we are going to do is put the link for Get grass in the demo mobile app so um, folks can can find it right there and and download the extension and start taking control of their um, residential ip address capabilities yeah um yeah i guess that's the call to action right uh download grass but make sure to use andy's ref link um the other yeah. uh the other thing yeah. i guess i'm just gonna quickly Demo's ref is... link, not mine no. everything is not i'm don't i'm donating all right. of my get grass points to the demo foundation just for the record so Right. Um, yeah. Like one, one other thing, uh, follow, follow grass on socials on, on Twitter, we post most of our updates, um, and we'll be having a pretty cool. big one soon. We're putting out like a much faster, more efficient version of the product. So, uh, yeah, stay Sweet. tuned. And thank you so much for having Excited me. Excited to see where it goes. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you.